Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you guys know about an opportunity to learn some of the most important skills in life, if not the most important skills. And those are the skills of learning and doing so rapidly, effectively, and easily. You see, guys, I'm putting on a completely free 60-minute webinar that you guys can check out where I will be going into my absolute best memory tips, learning tips, and speed reading tips so that you can immediately begin applying them and accelerating your learning of anything and everything. All you need to do to claim your spot in this free webinar is visit jle.vi slash webinar. We have showings at many different times throughout the days for every time zone, but you have to log in and claim your spot. So that's jle.vi slash webinar. And I really look forward to seeing what you guys achieve. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You guys, one of the only things that every nutritional expert that we've had on the show seems to actually agree on is that we all need to eat more vegetables, eat more greens, eat organic, cut out all the processed junk. Well, who has the time, right? Who has the time to go out, do the shopping, make the salads, make the juices, make the smoothies? And that's what I love so much about Organifi. Their product is an all organic green juice. It has all of the nutrients that you need. It tastes absolutely amazing. And it's made by wonderful people who I consider to be personal friends. And as listeners of this show, you guys can actually save 20% on your first order. And all you have to do is go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and use the coupon code superhuman at checkout. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. I am absolutely tickled that you have decided to spend the next 30 to 60 minutes with me. Today's episode is lovingly brought to you because Apple Laurel 00 from the US of A has decided to leave us a wonderful review, which says with five stars, motivating and inspiring. I've been listening to this podcast for months now and I love it. Not only does it provide me with exciting ideas and insights, it also provides me with new resources on a variety of topics. For example, this morning I woke up early and looked up Benjamin Hardy's article on eight things every person should do before eight o'clock and I already have a list of four more things I could add to my routine to enhance my life. Listening to this podcast is mind expanding. I look forward to using the tips and tricks as I become a superhuman myself. Well, thank you very, very much, Apple Laurel. I really, really appreciate that. And for those of you who haven't left a review, I'm going to talk you into it eventually. You might as well just do it now. (laughs) On to today's episode, you guys. Today, we are joined by a friend of mine from the real world, a recent friend who I was introduced to by one of my very best friends in the world. His name is Cedric Waldberger. Cedric is originally a Swiss national who today travels the world all year round and lives with only 64 things. He is passionate about startups. He's a serial entrepreneur and an investor and a blockchain enthusiast. He's working on a number of different startups, including Definity, a venture-backed blockchain startup, and, well, another one that you're going to hear about that I think is equally as interesting. He's co-founded a number of businesses around the world from Zurich, New York, Paris, Hong Kong, London, and Berlin. And he's held roles in the technology management side for the better part of two decades. He is all about growing businesses, but that's actually not what we spent the majority of the conversation talking about. What we talked about for 80% of the time was the level to which Cedric optimizes and deliberately thinks about his life and the way that he is living it. He is deliberate about everything he owns. He is deliberate about everything that he does. And he is deliberate about everything that he thinks and feels. I think it's a really fascinating approach to life. And I love the message at the end of the podcast where he explains what the point of it all is and why he puts so much effort into leading 
the perfect life. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode. I certainly did. As I said, Cedric has quickly become a personal friend of mine, and I think that you guys are very quickly going to understand why. So without any further ado, let me present to you my super friend, Mr. Cedric Waldberger. Cedric, good to see you. Well, hear you again. How are you, my friend? Very good. Thanks for having me, John. Awesome. Well, thanks for agreeing to be on the show. For audience background, the last time we spoke, we sat down to coffee and I think we made it 20 minutes into the conversation and I was like, you really, really got to be on the show and share some of this stuff with my audience. So I'm really excited about it and I want to give a shout out to our mutual friend, Maya, who introduced us and said that we just had to meet and she was absolutely right. She even had to get us to meet twice. Like, cause I, I remember I was in Tel Aviv a few years ago and she tried to get us together, but it didn't work out. So I'm really glad she, she mentioned it again and we made it this time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Cedric, I covered your bio a little bit in the intro, but I would love to hear you kind of describe who you are and what you do on one leg for our audience. And then we'll start getting into why and how you are so superhuman. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I would say I'm someone who is extremely passionate about creative problem solving. And one of the creative problems that I, I sink my teeth into over and over again is how to start a company or how to go from zero to 1 million in terms of building a business. Mm -hmm. Like you, I started very early on. I think I was 14 or 15 at the time when I first took like baby steps in entrepreneurship. And ever since then, I've been involved in one or multiple early stage companies so much that at some point I happened to be involved in companies on different continents. And that caused me to travel a lot. And that's when I took the time to think about like priorities in my life and how to live very consciously. And what I found out is that I'm very willing to give up some things in my life in order to profit the most from other areas of my life. So for me, being able to be there for my projects, meet with very interesting people. On the other side, I'm willing to give up on having a constant home base or owning many things. So over the last few years, I've, I've minimalized everything that I have, I got down to 64 items. And for over two years now, I haven't even had a, an apartment anywhere. I travel a lot. Last year, I think I was on over, over 120 flights. So I barely spent two or three days in the same place. I'm extremely enjoying life. I'm extremely happy. I'm getting a lot of value from all these meetings that I can attend and all these people that I'm fortunate to meet. Very cool. And we'll dive more into the 64 things I just discovered on your website that, of course, you have a spreadsheet that people can download to figure out what exactly these 64 things are. And of course, they are all black, which I love. <laughs> it keeps stuff uh, simplistic. So beyond minimalizing the stuff that I own, I also decided I want to reduce the amount of decisions I need to make that are not essential to my well-being or to my the quality of my life. And one thing that I realized at some point is that you can usually get a black version of something and black all fits well together. And just a few more reasons, but I decided to own everything in black just because that reduces the amount of decisions I need to make. Because once I decided I need a certain item, I never need to think about which version or which color I'm going to get it in. Brilliant. And I should note for people, I mean, some of these are, are really, really good. Like when you say 64 things, you pretty much mean 64 things, including passport, Two mobile phones, so two you know, of those. I think that's just incredible, and the idea of minimizing clutter has allowed you to fill that space with all these different businesses that you are in. Right. I think for me, it's been a very liberating process. At the beginning, it all started a few years ago as an experiment. Um, I think similar to you, I, just, I sometimes do experiments just for the sake of it. Like I, I discover an interesting question, and then I decide to dive into it. And I especially like questions that seem simple, but have a complicated answer. And one of these questions was, at some point I asked myself, how much stuff do I own? This is probably five or six years ago. I realized that even though the question is so simple, the answer was not simple for me at all, because I, I already had a sense that I, I did not have too much clutter because I have been moving around quite a bit. But I couldn't really say whether I owned 100 things or 500 or 2000. And that's where the journey started. So I went to my apartment and I started this spreadsheet that you found on my website and I started collecting everything that I owned. Wow. And I think at the time I owned over 600 items. And then from there, I think it became a uh, part game, but also part pragmatism to think about how can I further reduce the stuff that I own without missing out on anything in life. So my number one rule is, is not 
to get to the least amount of things possible, but to have the least amount of things while still enjoying everything in life that I want to enjoy. Mm. So a lot of times, I guess what that means is you end up renting things that other people would own. So for example, when you go skiing, you rent the absolute best skis, you know, every once in a while, for example. Exactly. What I found is that a renting stuff, even financially for me, because I, I don't go skiing that often is more practical. And also I travel so much that sometimes I would like to go skiing in the U S sometimes it's here in mm -hmm. Switzerland. Another time might be somewhere in Asia. So it's not really practical to bring my stuff anyway. And so I'd have to rent anyway, but this way I get access to the newest stuff and get to try something new every other time. Mm -hmm. And then also for like ski clothing, what I've realized is that we all have so much stuff that Whenever I need something, like there's usually a friend that can borrow me a second <laughs> jacket. Right. And like, isn't that absurd? Like there's never going to be a situation where you need two sets of skiing clothes, right? You're never going to wear them on top of each other. So that's, it's, it comes in extremely practical for me, but it was just something that occurred to me um, or that, that I wondered about when I first realized that how much stuff we actually have. We have stuff not only once, but we have it, often we have it like twice or three times. Yeah. One of the things that I most liked when we sat down and, and you know, it, obviously I immediately took notice that you own all black everything, but I liked the amount of deliberate intention that you put into buying something. I mean, if you're only going to own one jacket, as you told me, or one backpack, you do research, you have a team of VAs that will do the research and find the absolute best backpack that's going to work in every situation, the best jacket that's going to work in every situation. I like that, you know, rather than, well, I'll just buy two or three different jackets and then I have one for every situation. Yeah, it also brings me joy to know that everything that I own has at least one purpose, but very often the items have like multiple purposes. For example, I only own one pair of pants, mm -hmm. so they have to be both comfortable and good for casual stuff, but they also have to be ready or the right set of pants for business meetings. So I enjoy looking into like different types of fabrics that uh, dry quickly or easy to wash. I really do enjoy this research process as well. That's incredible. So tell me what, uh, I was tempted to ask what's your favorite, favorite thing, but I think that's really hard. What are two or three, you know, besides the obvious, the iPhone and the MacBook, what are two or three of your just, oh my God, how did I live without this possessions? Yeah, I think there's the productivity stuff, like my laptop, my phone, as you mentioned. I really enjoy my AirPods. Mm -hmm. It helped me to go from, because I have a laptop, a MacBook Pro that still had the, the normal headphone check, whereas my phone had the lightning port. Mm -hmm. So that helped me to go from like two pairs of headphones that were always tangled up in my pocket um, to just one. So most of the things are purely practical that I own. So there's also nothing that I have emotional attachment to. But there's uh, one thing that I carry around with me, which is not obvious why I do it, which is a drone. I carry a, a DJI Mavic. That's probably one of the hobbies that has nothing to do with anything that I do for work. I just enjoy having my drone and uh, seeing the world from a different perspective every now and then. So one of the probably like 15% of my belongings in terms of volume is my drone and the charger and extra batteries and stuff like that. Wow. It's also nice to hear that, you know, because I think people listening can be like, God, what a joyless existence. <laughs> but no, yeah, <laughs> it's nice to hear that you set aside like, you know what, this is just frivolous and fun. And it's nice to enjoy a hobby. Because you know, you don't own, I see musical instruments, any books you own are obviously digital, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I get most of the during my life I get from meeting people from encounters and interesting conversations. I try to detach myself from like being too emotional with things. So there's nothing that brings me joy just by its existence, but often by what I can use it for. So I get joy from all the stuff that I have because it enables me to have the lifestyle that I have. So I want to talk about that lifestyle as well, because as we were closing our conversation last time over breakfast, you mentioned something, which is that you track every minute of your life and you do a lot of statistics and a lot of optimization. I also track... Most of my time, I know where I am, you know, based on Wi-Fi, I track, I do the statistics, I know exactly how productive I am every week, how much time I spend in every app. I think you take it to a different level, which is logging moods and obviously which venture you're working on, which product, what ideas you're thinking about. Elaborate on that. I think you already pointed it out. I'm very left brain, so I like numbers and statistics. I'll take a step back. So every three months, every 90 days, 
I kind of start my year four times during the year. Instead of making annual goals or plan for the year, I plan for the next quarter. I found that 90 days for me is a much better time frame to look at when I set goals and review uh, my progress. And as part of that, I review 12 areas of my life. And one of them is friends and friendships. And one question that I ask myself every 90 days, among many others, one of them is, who are the five people that I've spent the most time with? Mm -hmm. And in the past, when I've asked myself that, I realized that sometimes it's hard for me to differentiate between who I think I should have spent the most time with and who I actually spent the most time with. And that triggered this experiment to track every second of my life. So I use a a software on my laptop. It's called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L dot com. And I've built a custom script that allows me to switch from one activity to another within less than a second. Like I, I have this very efficient workflow of logging what I spend my time on. And the way I think about it is not where I am or what my body is doing, what my brain is occupied with. So if I'm meeting with someone, that's like where my brain is, where my consciousness is right now. So I don't log whether I'm on an airplane or on a train or in an office, but I, I log whether I'm working on this project or that project or who I'm meeting with. And then what it has shown me is that now that I had a way to go back and look at exactly how many seconds I've spent last quarter with my best friend, my father, my mother, and so on, it gave me a way to see the difference between who I thought I should have spent the most time with and who I actually spent time with. And that helped me to readjust my priorities and, and actions to bring the two to an overlap. I really like that because, you know, I track a lot as well, but I like this idea of tracking the people you spend time with. And it's tough, I guess, unless you do it manually, it's tough because, you know, if I'm at a friend's house, I can add that as a Wi-Fi event and have it tracked automatically. But the reality of it is, you know, a lot of my time, I end up hosting a lot of people at my place and it ends up looking like time that I sat on the couch at home. But in fact, it was very high quality time hosting and being with people that I enjoy. Right. I thought about to what degree it could be automated. I think it's very hard to do unless you record everything in your life and you build very smart machine learning. So let's say you had your phone camera on all the time and your phone microphone, mm -hmm. which is kind of creepy, but maybe there's some information that you could extract from that to automatically lock that at least to like the precision that's needed for it to be useful. Right. Let me ask you this. The important thing that always comes down to for me is what do you do with the data? What are some decisions that you have taken differently? And what are some of the ways that you've actually created impact in your life based on the data that you're constantly accumulating and formulating? Mm hmm. Yeah. So one thing, if we talk about the time tracking, one thing I've already mentioned, I, I realized who I should be spending more time with. And I, I became conscious of that and changed things in my life or was more proactive about spending time with a certain person. Another thing that I've realized is how much time I spend on different projects. And what I realized was I was biased to spend more time with the projects that did not go well than with the projects that did go well which doesn't make sense, right? You should be investing most of your time into the projects that have the mm -hmm. highest chance of being successful and, and growing the biggest. So looking at my time and realizing that was very, very good for me. Another thing that I do is I, I wear a Fitbit tracker and I check my heart rate every now and then, especially my resting heart rate. And I see correlation between that and how well I feel, how much I sleep, uh, how much time I spend on an airplane or between different time zones. And there's been a lot of uh, learnings that I can take from them. And I, I now see it as a, an early warning signal. So if I see that my resting heart rate increases, I know that I should probably make sure I, I get a bit more breaks into my schedule and I sleep a bit more. Oh, I like that. That's a good one. I tried all these fitness trackers years and years ago when the first Fitbit came out and I found it to be completely lackluster in actionability. And so it was like, okay, you know, but I think they've gotten a lot better. I probably need to come back and give them another chance. I think that the heart rate feature is uh, is a killer feature, at least for me, for the way I use it. But I agree that you still need to see a lot of the correlation for yourself. It doesn't track enough, to, like 360 degrees of your life, good enough to come up with useful takeaways, at least for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And which one do you recommend? I can trust that you've picked the best one out there. <laughs> 
Well, I don't know about right now. So I there was actually a time when I wore like five different ones in parallel just to figure out how accurate they were and how they compared. I stuck with Fitbit. I use the Charge HR2 right now. They have a special version that is completely black that doesn't have a silver on the side. <laughs> um, I see, of yeah, course, but that, and you own that, it. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I use right now. I use it as a as a watch as well. I like the simplicity of it. It doesn't look any fancy or anything. And it has very long battery life compared to the Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. So Cedric, I want to ask you, I mean, it, I think it's easy for people listening to pick up on the accent and say, oh, well, you know, that's the Swiss for you. But I think there's a certain level above and beyond that has led you like it's led me to want to optimize and to want to get the most out of every minute of your life. Where does that come from, do you think? There's been a few key moments where I realized that I want to live life very consciously, where I realized that we only get to live every hour, every minute, every second, every day once. And I've just become very interested in how to make the most out of life. One experience that led me to that was when I diverged from my passion in startups and tried a corporate job. That was about five, six years ago. Because I thought, I've always done startups all my life. Maybe corporates is also something that I could enjoy. And I gave it a try. And I, I went to the other end of the spectrum and went into investment banking for a project. Oh wow! And I realized that where I was immediately frustrated by the fact that a lot of the people I worked with, even though they were extremely smart and driven, I felt they worked for incentives that ultimately didn't make them happy. So they were all motivated by monetary and materialistic goals. And I also saw how when they got to the next goal, immediately they wanted something bigger without even thinking about <laughs> what it is that they ultimately want. And what that triggered in me, besides finishing my project early, was that I spent quite a bit of time thinking about what is it that makes me happy. Because ultimately, we all we don't want money. We don't want a big car. We want to be happy. Mm -hmm. That's when we uh, feel successful and happy, right? So I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this. And what I discovered while I was observing myself is that I get joy from learning, from understanding the world, from seeing connection and correlation between various things in life. And especially this figuring out this process of how to go from an idea that I had at the bar last night to something that is a business. Mm -hmm. And at that point, once I realized that it became so easy to build all these routines and rules and rituals um, in my life to get the most out of this area of my life. That's why it became very easy for me to sacrifice certain things in life because I knew I would get more in another area of life in return. I really like that. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and when you look at it that way, it's, again, I think it's easy for people to look at just how deliberate you are and how much mental energy you put into your life and the way you spend time and the degree to which you travel and say, you know, aren't you taking the joy out of life? But really it's, it's about systematically putting in as much joy as possible in life. I agree. Also the, the one thing that I try to avoid in life is regret. I want to make many mistakes and I want to learn from them. And I think mistakes are just part of the process, but what I want to avoid is regretting having made a decision unconsciously. So let's say I have this feeling in the back of my mind that I should spend more time with my father, let's say, mm -hmm. but I never take the time to really confront that feeling and make changes in my life. And then something happens or let's say my dad passes away or whatever. I don't think I want to live with the regret I would have in that case where I know I had this feeling inside of me all this time and I knew I should change something, but I let myself be too busy to take action and change direction. So this has not actually happened to me, fortunately, but just as an example, that this is always what guides me, why I try to be so conscious and avoid regret and, and live very consciously. Wow. I think that's a really powerful example. And I'll mention for people who want to read further, we had Tim Urban on the show recently, and I love Tim from Wait But Why. I love his work. And he wrote an article, just a couple different articles on the perspective of time and just one of the points that is such a powerful moment is 
he did the calculation and tells people, if you are 18 years old, you've already used up 95% of your time with your parents. And millions of people have read that blog, but how many of us have actually taken the time and changed and made it so that every Sunday we are actually with our parents. So I love that distinction between knowing something in your head and, and actually implementing it in your life. Cedric, I want to ask you another question, which is first steps. What do you think? I mean, we, we've thrown out a lot of ideas and a lot of optimizations. What would you say would be a great first step for someone to either start simplifying their life or start living it more deliberately in the way that you've been so successful in doing? Yeah, I think there's a couple approaches. One thing that I can only recommend is try to observe yourself and figure out when is it that you're the happiest. Again, that's a very simple question, like what makes you happy? But for me, it took quite a bit of time to really figure out which situations or what actions it was that made me happy. So I think that's an interesting exercise. It can be done through journaling or just keep that question in the back of your mind. But think about what is it actually that what is it that actually makes me happy in my day to day life? And then think about what sacrifices you want to make to increase those moments and situations where you are happy. I think that could already lead to a much, much more conscious and happy life. When it's about simplifying stuff, if you, let's say you, you feel that you're dragged down by the amount of stuff that you own and, and you feel you have too much stuff in your life and it's taking energy from you. One process that I really enjoy, and I think Maya would be a great person to lead through this, but I, I can abbreviate the process. What I do is I call it the 90 process. So at the end of each quarter, I look at my list of stuff or earlier, I would just stand in front of my wardrobe or go through my apartment. And I look at every item and I ask myself, have I used this in the last 90 days? And am I going to use it in the next 90 days? Mm-hmm. And if the answer to that question is no, then the chances are very, very high that I will never touch that item again. I will just not need it in my life. And I can give it away. Because think about it, like in half a year, you have formal, informal events and situations. You have warm days, cold days, you travel, you're home. If you don't need it within half a a year, chances are high you're never going to need it again. What I then did at the beginning, because it was hard for me to just give stuff away or throw it away, I put it in a bag and I put that into a corner of my apartment or wardrobe or wherever. And I came back 90 days after. And if I had never taken the item out of that bag, it was much, much easier for me emotionally to get completely rid of it. Right. So putting it in a bag first and then getting rid of it 90 days later was much easier for me at the beginning because otherwise I always had this thought in the back of my mind, maybe there will be a chance that I'll use it. Maybe there's going to be that situation where I, I'll be glad I have this. That's a really good strategy. But truth be told, like it did not happen to me once that I went back to that bag and picked out anything. Right. I'm always telling my girlfriend, you know, she says, well, we might need it. My parents also have this, well, we might need it strategy. And I always tell her, I did this whole clean out and I probably need to do it again. But there's not been once where I, I mean, I don't even remember what I gave away in the last big clean out. I I have no idea what it was, much less, oh shit, you know, I wish I hadn't given that away. It's never happened. And then the other uh, exercise that I'm going through right now is... You know, I, I'm involved in quite a few projects at the same time. So while my like the physical part of my life has been very decluttered and reduced to 64 things, like sometimes I'm involved in as many as 15 projects at the same time within a month, which is way too many for my brain capacity. Mm-hmm. And I'm currently in the process of consolidating and letting go of some projects in favor of others. But that's been a very long process for me because it, it was hard for me to figure out a which courses to bet on. And then B also, I'm so thirsty for all the experiences I get A from the projects, but also from the people that I work with. that it's very hard for me to like, oh, because I, I think that's the most valuable part about building a company or solving a problem in general is like the learnings you get. So I try to immerse myself in as many different projects and learning processes as possible. Mm-hmm. But now I feel I have a very good idea of what I want to do with the next five to 10 years of my life and which projects I want to double down on, or or at least which areas I want to work in. So I'm currently in the process of decluttering that as well. So let's get into that. I mean, I said again in the bio, a little bit about the projects that you do, but what are you working on right now? And which ones are going to be the horses that you back? Yeah, I think 
the three projects that I spent the most time on right now are a blockchain project. It's called Definity, a computer vision project called Glimpse, and a productivity app called Scent Task. And while all the projects are very interesting and I'll learn a lot from them, the projects in the blockchain space right now, I feel, give me the most value because it's, there's the most happening in that space right now. And I feel that's my best shot at having a, a real impact in the world is, is leveraging blockchain technology and my early access and my understanding of both the technology and the psychological or business side of it and leveraging that. So I'm currently working towards spending as much time as possible on, on this project, Definity, mm-hmm. which is basically a more powerful version of Ethereum. So it will not only allow you to execute smart contracts, but it, it will be so much more powerful that it allows us to run any kind of application in a decentralized setup. So probably a few years from now, we'll be able to run something like Google or Facebook on a completely transparent, immutable, and decentralized platform. Wow. You had drawn this this link between the decentralization of your life and, and the decentralization of the technologies you're working on. Elaborate on that a little bit and explain to our audience that connection that you had explained to me. Yeah, I think we live in a very interesting time. Um, globalization has happened and we all travel a lot, or at least we interact with people from all over the world. And still, most of what we work with or what we work on is still very closely attached to a geography or a nation state. Right. So a company is either set up in Switzerland or the U.S. or Israel. And so the same is true for many other different concepts in our lives. And I think for some concepts in our life, that makes complete sense. Let's say local law and order or infrastructure, building roads and maintaining them. I think it makes complete sense that that these things are managed by a community that actually use them in real life. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a lot of concepts in our lives that I think are inherently detached from or should be detached from any physical infrastructure, something like education. There should be no attachment between education and uh, where I'm born or where I've grown up. I currently spend a lot of time thinking about once we have this more powerful decentralized architecture up and running, what are the things that we can do with that? And there's currently two projects or two ideas that I think about a lot. One is education. How can we leverage blockchain technology or technology as a whole to make education more fair, more widely available and equal? Because I think it's one of the big equalizers of our time is education. If if someone in a country that um, is less developed than Switzerland had access to the same kind of education that I got access to here in Switzerland, I think to a degree they would have similar opportunities later in life, whereas Mm -hmm. now they're handicapped. And the second thing is voting and governance and um, kind of self-regulation of communities, where I think once we introduce technology and and maybe an identity or a blockchain-based identity into our current voting process and governance processes, we can vote on a lot more things. And that comes with a set of benefits and challenges. But I think it's extremely interesting to talk about uh, how to build a more direct or liquid democracy. Absolutely. And I think it it becomes especially interesting with what we were talking about, where these governmental borders, especially for someone like you or someone like me that doesn't live or even necessarily visit their country of origin and citizenship, you know, how relevant are these boundaries that we've created with national borders and jurisdictions and social support systems? I agree. I think they're to a large degree, like from the perspective of now, I think they're very random. I think they made sense a few hundred years ago where it was all about defending your common interests against someone else's interests. And you just happened to interact with the people around you the most because you didn't travel that much. and There was no way to communicate with someone on the other end of the world. But times have changed and now communities are something much, much bigger than geographic or local communities. And so I think it it could also make the world a bit better if we all felt a bit more united and had this common platform where we all felt like we were part of the same planet and not just part of the same village or country. Yes, absolutely. Now, tell us a a little bit about Sentask because you and I barely covered this. And I think it's really, really interesting, especially given, you know, we recently had David Heinermeyer Hansen back on the show talking about the opportunity for living a superhuman life when you either run or are part of a decentralized distributed remote team. So yeah, tell us about that. 
Yeah, super exciting. And I'm a big fan of him. Uh, Basecamp is definitely a tool I've used a lot in the past. I, I love all kinds of productivity tools because I feel they give me more freedom in my life. If I have tools that give me ways to enhance myself and make myself superhuman, I can get a lot more done. Mm-hmm. So what I've seen in the past is with tools like Basecamp, Bazaar, or Trello, and all these other task managers, it's a very crowded space. But what we saw is that they're all built to interact with people you either have in your team or closely work with, or at least frequently work with. But what about the people that you only work with infrequently, or let's say once every three months or once a year, an example could be your lawyer or your accountant. What I've seen is while inside the companies, we've often found a very efficient way to collaborate through something like Basecamp or Asana. When it came to collaborating with these more like one-offs, like lawyers or accountants, I would always fall back into a very inefficient scheme of working together. I would use email or WhatsApp or whatnot. And it comes with all the downsides that are attached to that. So there's no tracking. It's very hard to figure out who's going to do the next step in a project. And it, for me, just leads to an overload of, of my brain because I try to keep track of that in my brain. And my brain is just not made to keep track of like 100 different tasks that I've sent out. So the idea behind send task is quite simple, but we feel it's powerful. We build a task manager with similar functionality to Basecamp, Trello, Azon, and so on. But it allows you to share tasks with anyone. And we do that by building something that, A, is something extremely intuitive, so there's no onboarding process needed. And then two, even more important, you can send tasks to someone and that person can interact with those tasks without creating an account. Nice. So you don't force someone to create yet another account and sign up to your tool first. They can just, they get the task via email, they can open a link in that email and they can interact with the task as if they had an account. Wow. That's huge. That's really, really huge. And and I definitely identified as we were talking. I mean, you said the doctor, the lawyer, the accountant. Well, I guess our bookkeeper now is a full part of our team. But, you know, I generally have to try and drag these people into my workspace and try and get them to sign up for an Asana account. I think it's really, really interesting, the idea of now, and especially if I can track it from somewhere like I know it integrates with Slack, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Another idea that we had was that it needs to be immediate. What we mean by that is you should not need to open yet another app when you want to create a task, but you should be able to create tasks from wherever you're already working. So Mm -hmm. for a lot of us, that means working in email, in in your inbox and Gmail or in Slack. And so we've built interfaces to these services where via natural language, you can create tasks. So if you follow a discussion in Slack and then at the end you come to a conclusion, You can create a task directly from there just via one of those slash commands that are available in Slack. Um, And what that causes is not only did you create a task, but you also made it very clear who's going to take the next step in that discussion. Because what we saw as a team before was that very often discussions happened and we came to a conclusion, but it was not clear who's going to do the next step. And then suddenly stuff got abandoned which was terrible, right? Because we had gone through all this process of coming to a conclusion and a solution, but then it got abandoned because no one was aware exactly who's going to take responsibility for the next steps. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it at the beginning. So for us, uh, similar to 37 Signals, we're also a completely distributed team. So we're 13 people by now in 12 different countries. We're split across, I think, six different time zones right now. Mm -hmm. And we use SendTask to build SendTask, which is an interesting experiment. So we try to build software that fuel teams like ours um, that are split over many different countries and don't sit in the same office. So we can't use a whiteboard or post-it task list, but we have to fully rely on digital communication for the most part. And uh, yeah, it's been a very interesting experiment so far. We've learned a lot along the way. Definitely sounds like it. And I think I probably need to give it a try and check it out. (laughs) Cedric, we're coming up on time here. So I want to ask you for some of your superhuman hacks. I know when it comes to diet and exercise, you have some very specific stuff. But in general, what are some of the things that you do to keep yourself performing even when you fly around the world and are working on 15 different projects? Yeah, for me to deal with travel, uh, some of the things that I've noticed is uh, you mentioned already like diet is important to me. So For example, for the last five years, I've only had still water. I don't drink coffee. I don't drink tea, no alcohol, no fruit juices. I don't eat any sugar. 
which may sound like a large uh, sacrifice, but for me, my experience was only the first three weeks was when I missed it. And after that, it became extremely normal and enjoyable for me, this diet. It made me a lot more balanced and it really helps me fall asleep and get up on time, even if I jump across time zones. I think in general, my approach is that if I feel something is missing from my life and that often happened when I started traveling, I tried to build it into my daily routine. So for example, early when I started traveling, I felt like I won't go to the gym. I won't work out if I'm traveling. I'm just going to do that while I'm at home and I have access mm -hmm. to my gym. But then what happened is once I started traveling 300 days out of the year, uh, suddenly I was not working out at all anymore. And what I did was build that into my daily routine. So now every day when I wake up, the first thing I do in the morning is wait, work out for 15 to 30 minutes. And I use body weight exercises. So I, I never have an excuse not to do it because I don't need any equipment. I can do it in a hotel room. I can do it in, a, in an airport lounge. I can do it in an apartment, wherever I am and whenever I have time. Mm -hmm. Another area where I felt similar is that I didn't make enough time to read because I always felt... Like usually the time when I finish work, I felt too tired to really dive into a book and consume its contents. On the other hand, what I realized is that every time I read a book, it really expanded my horizon and I truly enjoyed that process. So one adjustment that I made to my daily schedule or, or rituals was as soon as I get to the office or I start work, I read a book summary. So I don't burden myself with reading an hour or whatever per day, but I read one book summary and that can be as short as five minutes on certain days. I use an app called InstaRead for that. There's a similar one, which is bigger, I think, called Blinkist. Mm -hmm. And this way I've gone from reading or consuming the content of one book per month when I was still reading full books to almost 30 to 31 books per month. And I use that as a filter process. So I, I wouldn't say that reading a book summary is the same as reading the full book, but it helps me filter out the books that I really want to read versus others where I'm happy with what I've learned after I've read the book summary. Very nice. I think that's really, really wise. I really, really like that. Cedric, I'm looking at the clock now and I'm realizing that we have come to the end, but I want to ask, first off, how can people reach out and get in touch with you and where can they find the different projects that you're working on? So one good point to get in touch is my website. It's called 64things.com. 64 as a number and then T-H-I-N-G-S.com. I use the same handle on Instagram and Twitter if someone wants to get in touch. You'll also find me by Googling for my name. And on my website is also where you'll find links to all the different projects that I'm working on. Brilliant, brilliant. And I want to thank you for, you know, what's the word I want for helping us analyze and understand and dissect every aspect of your life. First, though, I want to ask for you, what would you say the most important takeaway that our audience should be reminded of was for this episode? Or the message, rather, that you'd have them take with them for the rest of their lives? I think I, I'd like your audience to think about what it is that makes them happy and how they can increase those moments in their life. Yes. That is the most timeless and most important thing. And I'm really glad that despite all the optimization and getting the most, it ultimately all comes down to that. So Cedric, again, I want to thank you very much for spending your time with us here today. It sounds like you and I are going to make a chance to grab coffee again, or I guess grab still water again in yeah. California in a couple of weeks. But I'm really looking forward to keeping in touch and continuing to make you one of the people that I spend more time with. So thank you again for your time today. No, thanks a lot for having me and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Awesome. Take care, my friend. You too. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today. But I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.